All right, thank you for staying with Daybreak. We're getting into that conversation. Our panelists are here, ready to roll. And the conversation we're having, we'd like to rope you in as well. It's the front page of the Daily Nation, debt driving Kenya to the tipping point. Before we get into that, let me introduce our guests real quick. Beginning from my immediate left, Philip Mwema, managing partner, Anderson Tax. Thank you so much for making time. Good. Tony Watima, an economist, is also here with us. He likes to call himself an independent economist. That's why he comes with punches left, right, and center. <laughs> Thank you for coming in, Tony. Harit Chiga is the vice president of the Society of Kenya. Santi Sana recently went to court and stopped the move to have the judiciary budget cut by 2.9 billion shillings. Will, will tell us what the effect of that has been. And Honorable Dr. Makali Mulu, member of Parliament Kitui Central, and also a member of the Budget and Appropriations Committee. That's right. right. The team that is being blamed for war is that <laughs> why, are we in, why are we in this hole that yeah. we find ourselves in? Yes. We'll talk a bit about that. I had some intro you know, lined out, but let me take it to the front page of the Daily Nation because it captures uh, our thoughts exactly. Debt driving Kenya to the tipping point. This is not a familiar, this is not an unfamiliar headline, but nevertheless, right now, it, the numbers are quite worrying. Distress signs, we have 2.7 trillion as the total domestic debt as of June 2019. 3.02 trillion total budget, not much of a difference between our total domestic debt and our total budget as well if you look at it 500 million is a loan which the daily nation says kenya has already defaulted on auction of a water supply system in mavoko and the gap between the country's budget commitments and its expected revenue is about 607.8 billion but trevor if you go to page four yeah i think you okay, get we, more details there let's go into the page four in just a bit but i also like that quote on the front on, still okay. on the front page running on empty that's essentially what they're still saying on the front page of the daily nation for failing to live within its means, the country could find it difficult to service debt when it matures within a year and bring itself into disrepute in the international money markets. What kind of impact will that have? That's a good could question. They just say that we've defaulted on our loans and therefore Kenya or what? And when you do that, you know? you're blacklisted <laughs> exactly. by other lenders and it's a big issue. And today we're expecting the World Bank to release the uh, Kenya economic update. Uh, which talks about, so, so apparently, you know, Daily Nation got access to an embargoed copy. 43% of domestic debt expected to mature within one year. Half mm -hmm. of our loans expected to mature within the next one year. Yeah. The government could face challenges in rolling over such bonds in an environment, uh, no interest rate caps, low subscription rates, and overexposure of commercial banks to these assets. Exactly. Well. We'd like to know from you as well, 22422 is SMS line at Trevor Mbidja to Citizen TV Kenya at Waiga Moura at Zinzi underscore K. Hashtag Daybreak. We'd like to hear recommendations on how do we get ourselves out of the current situation we are in. And we'd like to start with Tony. Tony, you keep saying that the governments need to get out of the economy. What does that even mean? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, what it essentially means is that um, government is participating too much in a role that they're not supposed to be in the economy. And one of the biggest things we have is that since uh, uh, the Jubilee government came in, uh, we have an ambitious budget to, to deliver in terms of spending. And one of the main things they look at is using borrowing and financing that budget. So you find that uh, they may not get the external loans they will want, they will go to the local market and borrow heavily. So when you borrow heavily as a government in the local market, you crowd out private sector. And we're in that position before the interest rate cap. Government had borrowed heavily within the local market, and the interest rate cap was just a nail in the coffin in terms of the private sector credit growth. So we, we are having a government that is participating too much, and you look at the numbers, they tell you that Kenya is growing at 5.6%, you're going to 6.1%. Most of that is because of government participation. And you ask anyone within the economy, they'll tell you they don't feel those numbers. Because uh, on macroeconomic calculations, so long as there's an activity, government is doing construction, is doing roads, is doing uh, all those kind of a thing, it will reflect as a macroeconomic activity. But in terms of standards of living, that will not translate. So that's the biggest problem that we have today. We find ourselves that we've been caught up with government's heavy investment in uh, infrastructure projects and such kind of a project but people don't feel that growth. That growth is not trickling down. Philip yes. uh, Moema, who's the managing partner at Anderson Tax, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And just to pick up from where Tony left off, talking about you know, large public spending at the very top, but the money not trickling down to the man on the ground. We now see a central bank governor who's beginning to express himself with terms that you may not have heard him speaking in the past. For example, he's recently quoted as saying, it is true that we have GDP numbers, but you can't eat GDP. What Kenyans uh -huh. are looking for at the end of the day is specific income, 
plus jobs as well. Is he now having a, a moment of truth, really looking at what's happening in the economy and feeling like I can no longer just stick to the script. I now need to really speak about the issues that are affecting ordinary Kenyans. What are your thoughts about statements like that by a man at his position? Interesting. I mean, especially coming from an economist, because if you look at let's put things in context. If you look at uh, June 2019, we had about uh, 5.8 trillion as a country, which is about so slightly 55%, 55% of our GDP borrowing. Contravening our PFM Act, which keeps the ceiling at about um, 50%. Then now we've gone into Parliament, removed the cap, we're borrowing about 9 trillion. June 2019, or the end of the uh, fiscal year for government, 50% of what KRA collected, about 890 million, went to paying debt. Okay? So we are in a classic position as a country. We are borrowing from Paul to pay Peter. Now, when you say don't look at GDP and people need. Uh, uh, jobs, jobs, and income. And, uh, jobs and income At the end of the day. within an economy in a context whereby the job cuts this year are precedented with companies laying off. Uh, I mean, we just had recently last week, so James Finley sending about 1,000 guys. Okay. There are many more. Allow me to inter interrupt you. We have a challenge with your microphone. Just so, so hold those <coughs> thoughts because I'm keen to hear you finish them properly. Let's bring in Harriet and uh, we're going to get the thoughts of the judiciary because your sector has suffered already. The pain and, uh, is being felt, uh, especially when you look at 50% cuts to the judiciary and then you went to court as well. Uh, how do you make, what's your take on all this and how bad is it on the ground? How bad is it for people who urgently need justice at the moment but are frustrated uh, beyond other frustrations that we've discussed here? Now it's simply that courts cannot convene, tribunals cannot sit, there's no money to move around, mobile courts cannot operate, digitization remains a mirage. Mm. I don't know, where do you want to start? Um, thank you, Wahiga. I think it's important and um, I'm, I'm happy that uh, we are now having honest discussions with each other. And this is cutting across all sectors, be, to, be it the professionals, be it the persons within the business, our farmers. This is something that is highly affecting all Kenyans. Uh, when we speak judiciary, and remember, and I want to tweak this a little bit and put it to contest. Currently, we are all fighting corruption. This is the same institution that we need them to sit and review these cases, pass judgments. But now as we sit, they cannot dispense of their activities. When you listen to the parliamentarians, the budget that was given to um, judiciary is at its bare minimum. Already. When you slash it by half, what are you doing? You're completely telling this institution, hey, judges just sit, you'll add your salary. At the end of the day, we'll do a sort analysis in terms of performance. And that's just it. Um, the reason as to why the judiciary needs this budget is purely to dispense of justice and to allow the wheels of justice to roll out its activities. There is so much that goes on, including our mobile courts now, they cannot, um, we cannot make use of the mobile courts. And the whole idea was actually to take justice closer to the people. Let's look at the expenses involved. When we talk about uh, criminals in remand, it's not any cheaper to the prisons where they are now forced to hold these criminals for a longer period of time mm. as we await hearing of these cases. And truth be told, right now as we sit and all lawyers will tell you, it's almost impossible to get a closer hearing date. What does that mean? Well, we so how far, how far forward are lawyers being told to come back to the courts? As as next stands, year you cannot get any, you cannot get any uh, hearing date for next year. So you have so to we're push talking it. 2021. We are, we are talking about 2021 and it's mid 2021. When you look at a uh, court infrastructure, to be very honest, they're in deplorable situation and dignifying situation. Uh, we have courts that currently are leaking, truth be told. Our courts are so small because look at when these constructions were done, way back. When you go to court right now, it's a whole pool, it's a mass of people. So what does this do? It, uh, it's, it's, it, it not only brings risk in terms of uh, those charged with the administration of justice, but also to the court users. You can imagine you're clamping a court with um, the, the, the 
everybody in there we have the judges we have uh, this is, we have the presiding officers of course yeah. we now have the criminals who are supposed to come in especially in the criminal courts this is very bad and then you have the general public yeah. look at the infrastructure simple facilities are actually in deplorable situation yeah. The general public usage of uh, common uh, areas you have the lawyers you have the judges i mean i mean it's important that people now just take a walk and just and do see for and see for themselves so even as it stands here um, in dates for court proceedings are quite extensive and now you're saying they'll be even no further away and and uh, dr mulu is here you're a member of the budget and appropriations committee yes. in parliament there's a general feeling that you have let kenyans down where do you think the problem really lies? How can you budget, and are we living beyond our means in your view, first of all? And how did we get here? And if we are, how did we get here? Oh, okay, let, let me first of all thank you for hosting us and uh, declare that other than being an, a member of parliament, I'm an economist by training. And let's, let's just simplify these things for Kenyans. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you talk about debt, the issue is uh, we're talking about public debt because these are public resources. We're not talking about private debt, which is your individual uh, debt. But, but we must all agree that uh, debt is important, even to an individual. These independent all, economists, all, all debt. That's why I want to start from there. I don't know if everyone would agree with that, uh, but carry on. Uh, let, you're, you're uh, the let, let me explain to you. I want to make it simple. Okay. In economics, we have what we call microeconomics and macroeconomics. Mm -hmm. Micro is more of household level. Macro is the national level. And uh, what happens is in economics is what is applicable at household level, you just need to replicate that to the national level. Let's ask you, why do you borrow at your first small level? You borrow because you have, you have clear goals you want to achieve. And when you look at your income at that point, you, you, you can't meet those, uh, those goals with your income. So you go to a bank, you go to an individual, you say, I want to do a house, which will take 500K, I have 400, I want to borrow 100. But you're able to pay back. So the thing is, that's the question. You say, how will I pay? So you have a repayment plan. Mm -hmm. That must be there. The same at the national level. As Kenyans, we do collect revenue every year. Uh, like now, the projected revenue collection was about 2.1 trillion. It has now been reviewed down. revised downwards to about 1.86. Basically because even when you are projecting your revenue collection, you have assumptions you, you make. You make a number of assumptions. That this will happen, this will happen. Now what has happened is over the years, we have been borrowing as a country. And you can, you can look at the, the history of public debt in this country. What has changed is how do we use our debt? And uh, we have said many times, and this is not a secret, that uh, any borrowing you do, you don't use it for recurring expenditure. You do it for development expenditure. Mm -hmm. Why do you do it for development expenditure? The expectation is, if you invest today, in 10 years to come, you'll be at a level where the returns from that investment will be able to pay uh, the debt. And that's why you are, when we're talking about public debt, you can't ignore comparing today's generation and future <coughs> generations. Because like when we, what you're just reading here today, that we have not managed to pay debt from, uh, to what? To pay jump credit. You, you need to ask yourself, when was this debt taken? When did we borrow in terms of timing? And you realize it is not yesterday. It was a number of years back. So now that is mature, it means if we had planned well, we should be asking where are we getting the money? But what is happening is we are doing a lot of borrowing. We are not doing, and more so we've said many times, that if you borrow, you must get it right in terms of the projects you're going to invest in. You must do a proper feasibility study. You must be able to say, what are going to be the returns after this time? That's why people talk about grace period in debt repayment. So that it allows you time to invest, and by the time the debt matures, you'll have started getting the returns. So what we're saying is we are, we are in a problem as a country. And we have said, if you look at, at the international debt indicators, because they are, you know there's always the international best practice, mm -hmm. where you say, if your debt is at this level, then are you in the red or are you doing well? And this, these indicators are there. All of our economists know them. I'm sure you're aware of them. Dr. Mulu, let me ask you this, and I don't yes. know how long you've sat in the Budget and Appropriations Committee. I've been there for the last six years. For the last six this years. This is my seventh year. Yes. So how often is your committee consulted when government 
is considering some of these large public debts that they want to take on, on in investment. Do you then do the things you're saying should be done where feasibility studies are carried out? Are, are you confident in projects like the SDR? What, you know, were those projects that you looked at deeply or were they negotiated long before you got there? What yeah. about the Nairobi Expressway, for example, which many are raising questions about as well in terms of feasibility? You, you know, normally what would happen, Parliament is not an implementing agency. It's more of an oversight and, and legislation. Mm -hmm. So what would happen is when we are doing the budgets, we normally, any time a government is presenting a budget, mm -hmm. there is also what we call debt strategy paper, which, is, which comes together with the budget, which is supposed to be expected to analyze how much you are borrowing this year and how you could spend that money. Now, what normally happens is, uh, and uh, to, to me, I think the, the issue is, I like what, uh, what she said, the issue of honesty. The, the other day you saw the CS Treasury telling Kenyans that we have actually been cheating Kenyans. That was really what he was saying in simple terms. That we've been told that the debt is below 50% of GDP, while in reality, as at last month, it was 6.4%, 58 of our, our GDP, our GDP is today is 10.2 trillion. We've already borrowed 5.8. And I can tell you even this month, there is rumor that another 200 million, 2 billion has, 200 billion has been borrowed, which is makes it to six. Rumor, how come you don't know yeah. these we, we, You know the thing is, they don't pass by your office. You know the thing is, let me tell you why you got, and it's important that we get to know this. What happens normally is, as parliament, we go by what is presented with us in terms of paperwork. Because the thing is, I can only say, if I don't have a paper like this saying, you this is what is written. And one thing we have said, if, if you look at our, our contribution in the House, we have said, I think time has come for this country to demand for independent audit of public debt. So you say the paperwork independent, is good, but the Because the paperwork is always... The paperwork, the paperwork. Yeah, the paperwork. Well. yeah even as we, that's a second question, we, we asked the CS... Uh, You've uh, been lied to by the CS, that's what you're saying. But <laughs> I'm not the one who's saying, what I'm saying is, when he came, yes. when Rotich was the CS, yes. and uh, Luke was the PS, look at all the documentation. Yes. It was saying public debt is below, below 50%. What you were saying of the GDP well, well, today? Got, when when, when, when the, you know, we also need to get yeah, back to him. Yeah, I hope yeah. his mic is what, okay. What, Finish what, that what, we can when, get when, when he, the new CS has come, the acting yeah. CS, he has gone on record to say that currently the public debt is 6.2, 60.4 percent of the GDP, way beyond the law. What the law says, and that's why they had to come to Parliament to bring the Parliament to go to nine trillion. So then, as a way of now legalizing, oh. yeah, obvious. And that's what we are saying. We really, we really <laughs> need and some independent audit of this public debt. I don't know if Philip Mwema's mic is now okay. We can <laughs> <laughs> give him a chance to. I mean, I, I'm glad Honorable Makali agrees and says our debt has become, we have a problem. And we do. Mm -hmm. yes. The question is, first of all, we've already contravened the PFM Act. Then we go in as parliament and agree and, 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 and change this to $9 trillion. What will stop? The next regime moving it from 13 trillion, 14 trillion, we are just postponing a problem. Do we have the capacity as a country to live within our means? Statistics and numbers don't lie. I'm an accountant. Exactly. I just understand numbers. Exactly. In the last five years, not even five years, seven years, Kenya has not been able to meet the targets they are given. Fact. 2019, 2020. Can we not meet their target in 2020? Fact, you come back to that and we can review this again come uh, next year, 2020, mm -hmm. come July us. So we're not able to generate funds internally to service our external debt. We are, the money that we're getting, we are paying salaries and recurrent expenditures. And in terms of borrowing for capital expenditure, it's a good thing, but viable capital expenditure. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. When we come in and now we're doing a great rally, to quote the terms, it's going nowhere. What's the return on investment looking through this? And as a country, should we get to a point in time, actually, we we look at our debt 
extinguish the expensive debt because we cannot postpone the problem and refinance our debt. And I like what you're saying because the four trillion that you've borrowed so far in the past, where has that money been put into? Can we have an, and, 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 and when you say, let's have an audit, the people that are, are watchdogs, yeah. the people are, are watchdogs for us as Bonanchi, it is a, the Honorable Makalis of this world, it is the members of parliament that are meant to put checks and balances. And he's and saying the paperwork looks good, but it, the, the implementation is where the problem is. In that in that paperwork that looks good, yeah. today, the four trillion that we've already swallowed or borrowed as a country so far, what has it been spent into? Can we have uh, an audit trail and a summary of what we expense to? And only that can we begin to understand yeah. how we are spending uh, uh, the money we are borrowing as a country. Because right now, I see a challenge, come 2022, the next government will pick up a huge debt. How we almost do don't want mm. to be <laughs> part of the decision making <laughs> team in that next <laughs> exactly. government. Exactly. Because you'll be, you, basically you will be technically insolvent as a country. If you look at uh, assets liability, technically you are insolvent. As an entire country. Okay. <laughs> Should we take a we break? Take a break okay. at that point. We'll allow, <laughs> I know they want to respond and we'll give them a chance to do so when we return. I think we have some feedback already. Can we put that up? 2242 is the SMS line. Yeah. The hashtag is daybreak. What uh, our conversation has gone to new levels and new heights before. <laughs> <laughs> some way India, I still can't get over the fact that also MPs can be lied to. Any. Some way India, the government should come up with a mathematical <laughs> approach to national income equilibrium. Work on the inflator and deflatory gaps before subjecting the country into economic habits. Inflator yeah. and deflatory gaps. <laughs> no, <sir. laughs> you'll explain to us what that means. At Shonko, Andrew, when we were told that the GDP has grown despite the state of the economy, it begs the question whether the figures being given are correct. And that That's is what we've just been talking we about right now. Let's see what else you're saying on social media here. Shonko, Andrew, still. It's the same one. It's the same tweet, actually. That's what we just read. D1956. Since the indicators of economic growth tagged as GDP are very different from people's expectations, i.e. increased consumer spending is an indication of economic growth, but people expect the opposite. However, raising the debt will be digging a hole to fill another. All right. Consumer um, spending, is it really increasing right now as we speak? Anyway, let's see what the next Yeah, because one. what are people spending? They, they don't they, have they money don't have in the money pockets. To spend anyway. Okay. Yeah? So we take that break. When we come back, we'll also be talking to one or two of our correspondents. Uh, what's the situation in the counties, uh, especially counties that relied on, for example, one mm -hmm. particular project in Kisumu, uh, in Nyeri as well, ETC. How are they faring, uh, whether it's farming, sugar, yeah. ETC, uh, you know, with the current state of the economy? For ground, which would be different. I think that's, that's the best way to, to describe the situation we'll find we find out. From there. <laughs> All right, we'll be, we'll be right back.